In this video, we're taking a look at how CMOS gates are implemented, in particular at the NAND gate, the NOR gate, at the OR gate, and so forth. And then we will also take a look at multiplexers and XOR gates. At the beginning, just a reminder how transistors act as switches, in particular NMOS and PMOS transistors. So on the left here we have the NMOS transistors, uh, S is the source, D is the drain, G is the gate, and the PMOS transistors is the same thing, but think of rotating this by 90 degrees, then you obtain this symbol, and we show that little circle here on the gate by showing that it's a PMOS uh, transistor. We look at those transistors in their um, switching mode, so there are either switches that are on or off, and here is a summary of what's happening. If the gate voltage is zero, that's uh, this line here, so we have here Vg equal to zero, then the NMOS transistor is going to be an open switch, and the drain voltage is uh, left open or floating. The PMOS transistor acts as a closed switch, and the, the drain voltage is equal to VDD, the positive supply voltage. When we have VG, VG equal to VDD, so that's the logic one voltage. Then that corresponds to the NMOS transistor being closed, and VD becomes equal to zero volts or equal to ground, and the PMOS transistor is opened and the VD voltage is floating. So you can see that uh, the two types of transistors are complementary. And that's what leads to the notion of CMOS implementations, having transistors which are complementary. If one type of transistor is a closed switch, then the other one will be an open switch and vice versa. So here is the implementation of an AND gate. There are two types of networks here. There is the lower network is shown here. That's called the pull-down network or PDN. And there is the upper network, that's the pull-up network or PUN. And the two act in coordination to actually implement the NAND gate. So the upper network consists of PMOS transistors and the lower or pull-down network consists of NMOS transistors. So what's happening here is that if both inputs are a 1, then both transistors T3 and T4 are on, and both of the transistors T2 and T1 are off. Okay, so that is both inputs 1, that's this case here. And in all other cases, at least one of the two inputs here is at zero, and if one of those two inputs is at zero, then there is no current that can flow through both of those transistors, because at least one of them is turned off, and the output then will stay high. So that's the case for those three um, cases here, when we have zero, 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 one, one, zero at the input. And if the voltage here is zero uh, for one of them, then we must have a logic one here. Okay, and for this trend, for this particular case, when this is zero, then this transistor here is on, and uh, this particular transistor is off. So this transistor pulls up, whereas this one here is opening up the, the pull-down network, and so Vf is going up to logic 1, 
or uh, VDD. It is instructive to look at the function that is implemented here. So f is equal to x1 uh, times x2, and then inverted, that's the NAND function. And using De Morgan's law, we can translate that into x1 naught plus x2 naught. So the pull-up network is actually implementing uh, this function x1 naught plus x2 naught because the gates here of the PMOS transistor they are inverting the inputs and the pull down network is the complement of this so that's uh, f naught just down here and the complement of this is just simply x1 times x2 and so that's what those two transistors in series here are implementing it's an AND connection of x1 and x2 and because they pull down the VF to ground it is an inversion of the actual function f and um, that's what makes it an AND gate. Suppose now that we want to implement an OR gate so now what we need is that um, in the case when both inputs are zero so if x1 is 0 and x2 is 0, then we need to have an output vf that is equal to 0. Okay. Now, it turns out that it's not easy uh, to do this with um, those PMOS and NMOS transistors. What is easy to do is to have some vg, say, to be equal to 1 when both of those are 0. So this point here is going to be the VG. So let's see how this works here. If both x1 is 0 and x2 is 0, then both of those transistors are turned off. Both of the NMOS transistors are turned off. And the PMOS transistors are both turned on. So that will pull the output high here. And then in order to make it an OR gate, we need an inverter. So we have here, if we divide this up, we have at this point here an OR gate. And then those two together, they form a NOT gate. And if any of those inputs, if any one of those inputs is 1, uh, let's say we're going to make x2 equal to 1, then this transistor here is going to be on. So that will pull the VG down to 0. And at the same time, when Vx2 is 1, uh, we will have a 1 at the gate of transistor 2. And that will turn this transistor here off. Okay, and so because those two are in series, we are not pulling anything up, we're only pulling down. And when we pull down here, then this one here will go to this output here will now go to one when the input goes to zero because that's an inverter. Okay, so now we have here Vg equal to Vdd or a logic one. So that implements an OR gate. The interesting thing is that an OR gate uses one, two, three, four transistors, and so did the NAND gate on the previous slide. And the OR gate is going to use six transistors because it has to be made out of an OR gate which is followed by an inverter or, or a NOT gate. Okay, similar for an AND gate, we would also use six transistors because we would have to implement it as an AND gate followed by a NOT gate. So now let's look at the more complicated gate, which is the XOR gate. Okay, so we're looking at XOR and the function of the XOR is shown here. 
x1 naught times x2 plus x1 times x2 naught. So this is a straightforward implementation here. Okay, it uses two AND gates, one OR gate, and two inverters. Okay, so in terms of transistors, the AND gate uses six, so we have here, because of two AND gates, we have 12 transistors. On this one, the OR gate uses six transistors. And each of the NOT gates uses two transistors, so that's four transistors here. And all together, that means we are using 22 transistors in that uh, straightforward implementation. Now it turns out that can be reduced. Uh, this circuit here, this circuit here also implements an XOR gate. And you can easily test that by writing down the uh, truth table for this. So, for example, if um, let's say this input is a 0 and this input is a 1, then we should get the 1 at the output. So, because this is a 0 up here, we would have a 1 here. And that 0 and that 1 together, that will still make a 1 here. And this one plus this one, they will make a zero here, and that will make a one at the output. And if we would have had, uh, let's say, both of those a one, as an example, then we would have a zero here. Okay, so okay, so we're going to get the zero here, and that zero will make both of those outputs a one. And that is going to make a zero at the output here. So we can see that this implements um, XOR gate. Each of the NAND gates, okay, so we have four times NAND, oops, And each of the NAND gates uses four transistors, so we have 16 transistors in this implementation. So we have gone down from 22 to 16 transistors. Now the question is, is there more reduction possible? So here is another way to implement the XOR gate using a multiplexer. So one of the inputs now controls which of the two inputs of the multiplexer is going to the output and if x2 is 0 then we feed x1 through to the output so that creates the term x2 not so that creates the term x2 not times x1 if this one here is 0 and if it is a 1 then the term uh, through the one input of the multiplexer goes through, so that is equal to x2 times x1 naught. That's this term back here. And so we do indeed have an XOR implementation this way. Now the question is, how many transistors is that going to use in CMOS? And to answer that question, we need to take a look at how many transistors are going to be used in that multiplexer. It turns out that the multiplexer can be implemented using what is known as a CMOS transmission gate. So here is the circuit of a transmission gate. It consists of two transistors, one PMOS and one NMOS. And what's happening is that if S inverted here, if that goes to zero, then the PMOS transistor is conducting, and if S here is going to one, then the NMOS transistor is conducting. Okay, so if the variable S is equal to one, then the output F is going to be equal to the input X. 
and S and, and S not here uh, both need to be controlled of course at the same time but if we let S go to 1 uh, S not go to 1 and S go to 0 then neither of those two transistors is conducting and this acts like an open switch and uh, we den denote that in here by showing C and that just means high impedance okay so it's a high impedance state where X and F are disconnected from each other here's uh, the equivalent circuit in terms of switches so when S is equal to 0 this acts like an open switch from X to F if S is equal to 1 then it acts like a closed switch from X to F okay so we can actually control um, the pass between X and F whether that's open or closed not just the pass going to ground or to VDD but the pass from one variable from one input variable to an output variable here's the graphical symbol for that and it schematically shows with those uh, two triangles here that there is a buffer going from left to right and the buffer going from right to uh, left and then the S and the S not controlling the gates of the two transistors. So now we can implement the multiplexer using two transmission gates. That's this part of the picture here. Okay, so this actually implements the multiplexer with uh, X2 as the selection terminal and the input this should be one here the input that goes into the zero portion of the multiplexer being x1 and then having this inverter down here okay that's this circuit here that goes in with the which is inverting x1 okay and the output then is equal to f and looking at this we know from the previous slide that the transmission gate here is using two transistors this one here is using another two transistors that makes four and then each of the inverters here want to control the selection of the a transmission gate and the other one to invert the one of the inputs x1 in this case that makes another four transistor so all together we actually need only eight transistors compared to having to use either 22 transistors when we implement this using AND and OR gates or uh, using 16 transistors when we use NAND gates so that's uh, big savings right there and that enables us to actually put twice as many XOR gates onto a particular area on an integrated circuit if you use this technology as opposed to the conventional uh, implementation which is NAND gates or AND and OR gates.